blessing to be here. For <laughs> Hang on. Oh, there's, there's that awesome AI voice. Let me know recordings in progress. Okay. <laughs> now we're really getting going. So yeah, yeah it's live. Anyways, now, it's, right? <laughs> okay. All right. Here we go. Um, it is always an honor to be able to be with God's people. You know, I, it's a very fearful thing to um, just come into the fellowship and to be responsible for sharing God's word. You know, I, I take it differently than, than just fellowshipping with one another, you know, in a casual way. It's, it's a hard thing to be able to be responsible for handing God's word. You know, not, not everyone ought to think you should be a teacher and we're to rightly divide the word of truth, you know, and, and uh, so that we have no need of being ashamed. So anyways, I don't take it lightly. And I thank you for being able to be here with you guys. And as Mike said, faith is a big deal. Like talk about the understatement of, of the uh, history of humanity. Faith actually is the only deal. Faith is, is spent, sorry, there's some background noise going on. There's a couple unmuted things going on. Um, faith is, faith is, is a big deal because it's literally central to everything from the onset from Genesis three onward. It has been all centralized on faith. Faith is at the root of our testimony. It testifies to what we believe or disbelieve about Christ. And, and faith is, is such a big deal because it's an open rebuke to the powers of darkness. It's an open rebuke to the rebel angels. They saw in full they knew in full, they had a, a complete awareness of the power, the majesty, the sovereignty, the love, the wisdom, the, the creative abilities, right? The power, the power, the power of Yahweh Elohim, the one true God. They had the fullness of knowing. They knew him in full. They were in his presence and they chose, they had free will too, to not worship him. And they chose to reject him. That's why he says, by faith, you will be, it'll be accounted to you and accredited to you as righteousness, solely as a finger in the eyes of those rebels who knew me in full and they refused to worship me. And he goes, watch this. I'm going to create from the dust. They're dust. They're not even like you celestial beings and they will know in part and they will see in part and they will prophesy in part and they'll look through a glass dimly and they will choose by faith to worship me and to obey my son and to receive my son for who he is just because of what I, little I have revealed to him about myself. And it stands forever as an open rebuke against the rebels of the powers of the darkness. And here's why else faith is a big deal. So there's three reasons, right? Faith is a big deal. The other reason why faith is a big deal and why it's all about faith and action, faith and action, faith and action, by faith, by faith, by faith, all throughout the scriptures, the entire summation is about faith, which is belief and God that he is who he says he is, is because your faith is temporary. That's why it's a big deal. Your faith is temporary. It is, it has it has bookends on it. It began at the fall. It ends at the second coming of Jesus Christ because one day your faith will become sight. And one day your hope will come into fruition. That's why it says, you know, in 1 Corinthians 13 about faith and hope and love bind all these together. But the greatest of these is love. Why? Because faith and hope are going to pass away as soon as you see the Lord face to face. So this is how my, my dad explained it to me one time as a young man. When I, when I was complaining and woe is me doing the Eeyore thing, you know, about, oh, how hard it is to obey the Lord, how hard it is to, to stay in his will, how hard it is to walk by faith. My dad kind of looked at me like, get off of yourself already, right? This is where the whole suck it up buttercup thing comes from. Like, get off of it already. He's like, you have one shot, this one grain of sand and a sea of sand to show the Lord how much you actually value what he's done for you. And it's only by faith. You have one shot, son. And he said, because one day it's all going to be over. You'll have no more opportunities to show him by faith that you believe that he is who he says he is and that he's sufficient and that he's good and that he loves you and that you, you are adopted and that you're an heir and that you have an inheritance. He said, you have one shot, son. What in the world are you complaining about? He's like, he didn't even withhold his son from you. When you were his enemy, what else is he going to withhold from you? He's like, you have one shot to walk by faith. And I was like, whoa, I never even thought about it that way because all I'd been told in the seeker friendly church is that it was all about me. 
And it's all about my comfort. It's all about my health and wealth. It's all about my advancement. It was all about my specialness. I literally had a pastor one time tell me, I said, what do you think your role is as a shepherd? He said verbatim, well, let me think about that. My purpose as a shepherd is to make sure that everybody knows how special they are. And I was like, no wonder why the church is in the state that we're in. It has nothing to do with our specialness. It has everything to do with his specialness, which is why we walk by faith, right? So what we have in this church dispensation is this completely unbelievable reductionist worldview of what faith even is. Literally, the word faith has been reduced to a, 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 a moniker or, or a Christianese soundbite of, I believe that Jesus died on the cross. And they go, that's faith. So yeah, I'm in the faith. Sure, I walk by faith. Yes, I have faith because, and, and they're actually saying that with intellectual honesty. They're actually honestly saying that because that's all they've known. That's literally all they understand faith to be is this, is this initial coming into the kingdom of God, this initial acknowledgement that Christ actually is God veiled in flesh. Christ actually lived a sinless life. He died on the cross, but more than that, the power of God is in the fact that he was resurrected from the dead. And in it, he conquered the sin. So they go, yeah, I have faith. And it's like, yet you read all these scriptures. I'm like, well, what do you do with 1 John 3? And, and what do you do with James 2? And, and what do you do with Hebrews 11 and Hebrews 12? And what do you do with, with 1 Corinthians? And what do you do? Like, what do you do with all these verses about my righteous ones will live by faith? And without faith, it's impossible to please me. What do you do with the verses that say your faith without works or without deeds is utterly dead? Or how about the fact that your faith and your works work together for the production of something? Or how about if anybody says they have faith, but do not have the works to back it up, they actually are a liar and they are not in the faith, right? Like, what do you do with these things? Because because then people, they want to swing these doctrinal pendulums and go, whoa, whoa, oh, whoa, hey, did you just say it's by works that we're saved? Did you, did you just... Did you just say that it's by works that we're saved? Oh my goodness. Oh man, that, that makes all of our Calvinism, Arminianism, and all these other little, little radar things go off in everybody's brains because the secret doctrines of demons bring the way of truth and disrepute in the church. When it says very plainly, right? Let me turn there. Very plainly in, in James 2, you see that a person is justified by what he does, not by faith alone justification justification comes by what he does not just by faith alone because if the faith is true if the faith is pure if the faith is sincere then guess what follows the actions the activity the works the works follow because of an overflow so it's not the works that make you justified it's the faith that then accompanying the works, right? This is all James 2, the faith with the works actually are working together in you to testify that you actually do believe what you're saying that you believe, right? And so then that's why we have all these beautiful scriptures about, about the testing of your faith, right? That like, I, how about First Peter 1? I'm just thinking that's off the top of my head that, that these trials have come to you these fiery trials have come to you so that, circle it, the testing of your faith may be proved genuine, though it's more precious than gold, though refined in a fire, and may result in something. There's, there, it's producing something, right? This faith, this testing, these fiery trials, testing your faith that it may be proved genuine is doing something that says that it may result in glory and honor and praise at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Oh my goodness, right? Like, like, think of this. This is radical. That, that the Lord of glory, the King of glory, the Lord of lords, the King of kings, many crowns upon his head, many diadems, right? Everything was made for him, through him, and back unto him. The father says, I want my son to be known. And the son says, no, I want my father to be known, everybody, right? He says, I'm actually going to give you glory, honor, and praise when I'm revealed. How, how insane is this, right? Like who in the world is this God that we serve? I know what I am every day. I know all you are very well aware of what you are every day. And he says, I'm going to give you that. So don't worry about the fire trials because it's testing your faith. And listen, your faith is being tested to do something in you. It's supposed to do something in you. I am proving to you that what you say you believe is actually true. Does everybody understand that? It can get kind of get conceptually mixed up in there. 
Jesus says, God says, 1 Peter 1, I bring hardships, struggles, trials, testings, temptations, all these things in your life, the pressures of the world, the pressures of the fallen world. I allow these fiery trials in you because I'm actually going to prove to you that your faith is genuine. I can't, who the world is this guy that we serve? It's like David, right? When he's like, hey, God, I'm going to build you a house. Listen, I love you. You're so awesome. Like, I want to worship you. I want your name to be glorified in all the land. I'm going to build you a house. And what's God's response to David? What? You're going to build me a house? No, 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 no. You got it all wrong. I'm going to build you a house. And you remember what David, he's like, who, is this your normal way of acting with men? Even David saying, he's like, who? Who am I, God, that you're mindful of me? Is this your normal way of interacting with men and, and, and families? This is insane. What do you mean you're going to build me a house? And so we do the same thing in our, all, our own lives. We go, Lord, I'll show you. I'll show you my faith. I'll prove my faith to you. I prove my faith to you. Watch God, watch what I'll do. And, and we will, and we strive and we will and strive to try to prove our faith to the Lord. And he's like literally laughing as like a father watching his toddler, like swinging at the air, right? He laughs and he goes, you're going to prove to me your faith. No, 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 no. Listen, I am going to bring fiery trials throughout your life to prove to you that your faith is genuine. You will know that you know that you know by the end of your life that you do love me, that your whole hope is in me, that I am your everything. I'm your identity. I am the alpha. I'm the omega. I am your savior. I'm your comforter. I'm your provider. I'm a warrior king. I'm a good king. I'm a just king. I'm going to prove to you by the end of your life, you will know. I, I'm thinking of some, I think it's Psalm 119. 134, 137, I can't remember off the top of my head. David's saying this right in that huge long Psalm, Psalm 119. And he says, he says, uh, um, now I can't remember. Um, he, he says, I've tested all of your promises and found them to be good. He says, my zeal wears me out because your commands are not obeyed, but I have tested all your promises and found them to be good. The Lord's like, yes, now your faith has been proved genuine. When I give you a word and hope deferred makes your heart sick because all your hopes are being deferred, being deferred, being deferred, you keep the faith. You keep the faith. You're going from faith to faith and you're keeping the faith and it will be proved genuine and it's going to result in something. Glory and honor and praise when the Son of Man is revealed. So this is why faith is such a big deal but not faith in words only. Remember that section in James 2? You know, he's actually mocking them when they say, show me your faith without deeds and I'll show you my faith by my deeds. Like that's it. Like this is, a, he's straight up rebuking, right? The church, James is writing this letter to believers. He's like, he's like, you say you have faith. Well, okay. Like that, that really has no weight. You say, well, some have faith and some have deeds. Well, he goes, how about this? I'll show you my faith by my deeds. And then here is the, like one of the most, when you think about it, the biggest gut check rebukes, rebukes ever when it comes to this idea of faith and works coming together. He says, you believe that there is one God good. Even the demons believe that. And at least they shudder, right? Like that's how big a deal he's saying. People who like to throw around the word faith, well, I'm just going to walk by faith. Well, I'll just have faith. I'll just believe. And, it, and what James is reminding us here and all the scriptures are through the heroes of the faith is put your money where your mouth is at. You have to put your money where your mouth is at. It is very easy, like Mike was saying, kind of to this intro to, to, say, to say that, yes, I have faith and I have a 401k and I have my AARP and I have my social security and I have my pension and then I have health insurance and then I have dental insurance and then I have life insurance and I have car insurance and I have boat insurance and I have camper insurance because now I'm retired and I'm living my best, best life now. And, and, uh, and I have a pretty good inheritance from when my, it's like, yeah, Nice try, dude. Like there's no faith being required of you. And I'm not saying like, I'm not saying that those things, right? It's bear with me. Okay. As we work, wrestle this out, bear with me. Obviously there's good stewardship and the Lord gives good gifts, right? I'm not diminishing any of that. What I'm saying though, is oftentimes we say, yes, I have faith. When in reality, it's actually all, all humanistic. 
It's actually all within our own ability. It's within our own means and it's by our own flesh. And Jeremiah 17 reminds us, I think of this verse all the time, cursed is the one who trusts in men whose strength is in the flesh. It says he will be like a, like a tree in a thistle that burns up in an instant. Cursed is the one whose strength is in men, whose confidence is in the flesh. That means in yourself. That means in, in, even, in, even in your ability to, to be a good steward of money and Dave Ramsey it up your whole life, right? So that you have this perfection of, of uh, security built in around you. And we say that's good stewardship. The Lord says, no, that's flesh. No, that's confidence in you. That's confidence in your own abilities. That's confidence in everything. And in fact, you are so AJ squared away with your reality. You actually have no need of me because you have no need of faith. And without faith, it's impossible to please me. But my righteous ones, oh, my righteous ones will live by faith. And guess what it says in Daniel 12, 3 about the end of time. Times of like which never has been and never will be again. And at that time, Michael the Archangel will rise on behalf of God's holy people. And it says, and those who are wise will turn many back to righteousness and they will shine like stars in the universe from everlasting to everlasting. Listen, you cannot turn somebody towards righteousness unless you yourself possess righteousness and are able to hold it out. And you cannot possess righteousness and hold it out if you yourself are not walking by faith. Did everybody catch that? I know it's a crazy, it's a feedback loop, right? It's this crazy feedback loop. And so you look at all these the context of this great scriptures about how we've been called to obedience that comes by faith. Oh, wait. So, oh, so faith equals obedience. Oh, faith equals deeds. Oh, faith equals activity or action. Faith equals physical, tangible verbs. I'm not an English major, but I know what a verb is, right? So like, if you notice all the heroes of the faith, right? And, 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 uh, in Hebrews 11, well, here, I'll just, I'll power through some of them real quick, right? Because it's, it's, I mean, he, think of the wonders of this, and it's all by faith. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for, a commendation. It's a military medal pinned upon your chest. Remember, he said the testing of your faith proved genuine will result in glory and honor and praise at the revealing of the Son of Man. Here he says, this was to their commendation. So there's commendations, there's honor, there's glory, there's praise. Look at what all is connected to faith. But now listen to this account. And every single one of them is attached to a verb a verb. There is action to their faith. That's what makes it be proved sincere, right? By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was committed as a righteous man when God spoke well of his offering. And by faith, he still speaks even though he's dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from his life so that he did not experience death. He, he could not be found because God had taken him away for he was taken. He was commended as one who pleased God and without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and circle it. He rewards those who earnestly seek him. The, Okay, See, listen for all the verbs. Listen for by faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen and holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By faith, he condemned the world and became the heir of righteousness that comes by faith. Righteousness cannot come by any other means other than by faith. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he did that. And it goes on into all these, all these wonderful things about, about the faith of Abraham. 
and about the promises of these peoples who worked it out, who wrestled it out, who endured, who persevered, who entered into things by faith, not even knowing or understanding at all what the outcome would be, but they did it anyways because they knew enough of God to know that he was more than sufficient, right? And so it goes on, it goes through Moses and it goes through through even the midwives who were not afraid of the king's edicts and by faith they hid Moses, right? And then it goes on to this in, uh, in, in verse 31. By faith, or verse 29, by faith, the people passed through the Red Sea. That's action, right? As they do on dry land, when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. And by faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the people marched around them for seven days. And by faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. And what more shall I say? I don't even have time to tell you about Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jetheth and David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith, listen to the verbs, who through their faith, where, did I, where am I at? They conquered kingdoms. They administered justice. They gained, so they laid hold of what was promised. They shut the mouths of lions. They quenched the fury of the flames. They escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, who became powerful in battle and routed foreign enemies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better, re, re, uh, better resurrection. Some faced jeers and floggings, while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned. They were sawed in two. They were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in the deserts and the mountains and in caves and holes in the grounds. These were all commended for their faith. Yet none of them had received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us so that only together with us, they would be made perfect by faith, by faith with action. And so we have to stop being the consumeristic Christians that think it's all about ourselves. Even, and th th I'm not rebuke, I'm, I'm not giving a rebuke, right? But if, it, if there's conviction, then praise the Lord, right? That's his mercy to, to convict us willingly now rather than later on desperately. But, but you know, a lot of people, even when I go, you go speak at places, Mike and Jeannie, others of you, you know, uh, you, you realize that still, even as much as we press into these things that the majority of people in our hearing are still just consumers. And the faith aspect of is what is missing in their life. Or they say, I've had faith in the past, so that's sufficient for today. Because the Lord has required me things in the past and by faith I entered into him, so that's sufficient for today. I'm telling you, by faith, Every single day, you have to get up and go pick up the manna again by faith. Yesterday's manna was predestined to spoil by God's wisdom so that each day you have to get back up. You have to get out of the house. You have to walk out. See, these are all verbs, right? This is all activity. You have to physically pick up the manna and physically praise the Lord for what he's provided for you that day. And when we operate out from that paradigm and when we're walking out from this reality, you realize that what the Lord is actually beckoning all of us into, every single one who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, what he's actually beckoning you into is a walk of faith that is far, far, far more costly than what you're currently doing, but it has far, far, far more wondrous rewards than what you can even fathom or understand. It's costly to walk by faith. That's why Jesus said, hey, count the costs. Like, listen, you want to follow me, right? There's, 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 there's going to be things involved, right? You better count the cost. No, no general sends his army to battle without first counting the cost, right? No man sets out to build his house without first counting the cost of whether or not he's able to do it. We have to count the cost of what it looks like to be all in to walk by faith. And I'm telling you, it is unbelievably costly. At a minimum, it's unbelievably uncomfortable. I know Mike and Jeannie, many of you can testify to this. It is unbelievably uncomfortable every day, not having a clue what you're doing or why you're doing it or where you're going. I mean, I'm like, dude, I'm like a blind man groping around the darkness. Mike knows because I call and, and, uh, and he'll encourage me when I need encouragement. I'll encourage him when he needs encouragement. It's like, man, I feel like a bumbling dope 
moron bumping into walls like a bland man groping around the darkness. I don't have a clue what I'm supposed to be doing every day. I don't have a clue of what penny. I don't have a clue if I'm going to have a roof over my head tomorrow. I don't have a clue. But this is what I do know. I know that those whose hope is in the Lord will never be ashamed and their faces are radiant. I do know this. Once I was young and now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging for bread. I do know this, that his, that his faithfulness is my shield and buckler. I know that his faithfulness to me is why I can rest. It's not about my faithfulness to him. He's going to be faithful to me. And I do know that he has promised that the good work he began in me, he will see through to completion, whatever it requires, and that he will guard me by his power to an inheritance in heaven that is being kept for me, that is spotless, unspooled, and fading. He's going to get me home to it. And I do know this, that the blood of Christ Jesus and Christ himself is more than able to present me before the Father, blameless and with great joy. I do know that. So I go, I don't know any of these other things, Lord, but I, but I know that. And that's enough to say, Lord, what would you have me do today? And, and this isn't about me and my testimony. The Lord's required some, some things of me, you know, in my life. And, uh, and he's continuing to do so right now. I mean, this thing, a lot of you guys know that I was, I literally just got back from Colorado super late last night and, uh, and was out there. Cause I'm like, the Lord's requiring something else of me. And you know what my prayer is? Listen, this is just the reality. I'm like, Oh Lord, please. No, no more, no more God. Like, I'm so weary. I'm so weary, Lord. Not one more crushing, not one more, not one more hour in Gethsemane, Lord. No, no, no. Like, please, no, God, don't make me enter into anything else. Can I, can I just have a breath? And yet I hear his loving voice saying, hey, it's hard for me to say, you said when you fell on your knees in that park, Lord, take my whole life, do whatever you have to, just make me a righteous man. I am satisfying the desire of your heart and my righteous ones will live by faith. And I go, oh God, I didn't know what it would cost. I had no idea what it would cost. And he's like, that's why I don't show you at all ahead of time because you'd cut and run. I give you, my grace is sufficient for today. I didn't say tomorrow and I didn't say big picture. And I didn't say macro understanding. I said, my grace is sufficient today. It will be sufficient for you. So keep walking by faith because you said, Lord, do whatever you have to just make me a righteous man. And it didn't dawn on me. I used to war in my spirit before the Lord. I was like Psalm 73, where it says uh, when my spirit was grieved and, and, and grieved and embittered, I was ignorant, a brute beast before you, God. I used to be even walking with the Lord, right? Communing with the Lord and being in the word and praying. I was a brute beast before the Lord because I was grieved and embittered in my spirit by my lot in life. And I didn't realize that the wisdom of God was he was actually satisfying the desire of my heart. And he was proving to me the genuineness of my faith. That's why it was so hard because he loves me. That's why it was so hard because he actually knows the true desire of my heart. He's like, you said you wanted it. I know that that was in, and, and you know what it dawned on me when the Lord finally rest, had me wrestle this out after a decade of shaking my fist at the heavens every day was, it was, I realized like, like you, you, you love me that much. And then, and then I had this profound revelation, like, wait a minute. This is actually cause for worship. That means that when I prayed that in that park, it wasn't just an escapism. It wasn't, I feel crummy about my situation. It wasn't a, a worldly carnal sorrow. It was a godly sorrow. That means if you're satisfying that desire, that means that might, that must actually be in my heart of hearts, what I want. And I was like, praise God. How could I put that in there? You put that in there, that desire, right? So anyways, I don't know where I'm going with all this other than say, Faith is, is everything that's required of us. So it's, it's, it's by faith that when warned about not things not yet seen, Noah in what? In holy fear, he built an ark and by it saved his family. And that's what was credited to him as righteousness. By faith, Abraham took his son to sacrifice him, even though God had said he is the son of a promise. And through him, there would be, by faith, he took him up there. And by faith, he raised a knife to him because he reasoned that God must be able to resurrect him from the dead. 
by faith he did that, right? And, and the only way that we are going to be able to endure the time of testing that's coming on this nation, the time of testing that's coming on, on all the apostasy in the church, the time of testing that's coming in all your realities right now, like I know most of you have some pretty difficult things going on in your lives and relationships and everything else. The only way you can be strong in the Lord and go forth and do daring feats of valor, even in those nearest, dearest relationships to you, is if you choose to walk by faith and not by sight, completely undone, completely unrestrained. Like Mike said at the beginning, the prayer is, Lord, what would you have me do? What would you have me do? And then stop talking, literally, like just stop, stop praying, stop talking, stop babbling, be willing to be so undone and prostrate you before the Lord that you ask, Lord, what would you have me do? And then like, I think it was Habakkuk, Maybe he says, I'm going to sit at the gates and wait and see what you have to say, what, what your answer is to my request. I'm, going to, I'm just going to sit here and I'm going to wait. I'm resolved to inquire of you, Lord Jehoshaphat. Like I'm resolved to inquire you, Lord, what would you have me do? I'm just going to sit here and wait until you answer me. And you might be uh, horrified at what he says, but it's for your good, for his glory and for your joy. He might say, like he did to me one night, he said, make yourself available. No, I mean, I'll go back. He said, don't marry that girl. That was, and you don't get to know why. I just said, don't, and that's all you get to know. But I love her, but we're going to have a godly family. But we both just came up. No, I said, don't marry her. And that's all you get. So now you get to choose by faith or by sight, fear or trust, whatever the case is, you know, and then it's like, don't take that job. Don't do this. And, and there's never any big laid out plan of the why, hence why it requires faith, right? Jamie, right? Jamie, feed my sheep. You guys have probably heard this part of my testimony before. You guys remember what my statement was when he said, feed my sheep? I said, I hate your sheep, God. That's, that was my response. And he said, I said, feed my sheep, son. And I said, Lord, your sheep don't want you. And he said, Jamie, I said, feed my sheep, but only those with ears to hear. I said, okay, Lord, not my will be done, but your will. Like, may everything be done according to what you've said. But what does that even mean? I don't know. What does that mean, feed your sheep? He's like, you don't get to know that. Like, you just get that. And he said, make yourself available. What's that mean, make yourself available? I don't, there's no other details about what that means. By faith, honey, Virginia, the Lord said, make us, make ourselves available. And she's like, well, then you better be obedient. What's that mean? I go, I don't know. I mean, let's just sell everything and then we'll be available. Because as long as we have a mortgage, we're not available. And as long as I think it's all about getting to that pension, we're not available. And, all, and if I'm fearful of us not having health care as a young family, we're not available. And if I'm fearful of the reproach of men and of my parents and of her parents and of our family, because I look like a bad leader of my household, because now I'm not providing the security and comfort for them, like we're not available. So by faith, I don't know. He said, make ourselves available. By faith, I'm going to make us available. And within two weeks, Everything was gone and we were living in our in-laws basement with nothing, looking like a fool to the world, but it was the wisdom of God that I was pursuing, right? So by faith, we do these things. And, and again, it's only by faith that, that we actually can be a useful tool in the hand of the Lord. There's a couple places in scripture where the word slave of Christ or servant of Christ is actually translated from the Greek as a useful tool in the hand of a master. And I go, Lord, I want to be a useful tool. I mean, I'm a tool in a lot of other ways, right? <laughs> like, don't get me wrong, but I want to be like that kind of tool, right? I want to be a useful tool of the Lord, a useful tool in the hand of the, of the master. And, um, you know, I know that we could talk about this forever, but the bottom line is what would the Lord have you do? Um, and don't let it create chaos in your spirit when you hear kind of a, a talking or a rundown on faith like this, because I know it does, because you go, okay, what should I be doing, right? And you're like a dog released in a dog park, like, oh, what? okay, okay, he said, put faith in action, what do I need to be doing, right? And it's like, and, and then your spirit gets in cast, like, stop, okay, it's Isaiah, Isaiah 30, 15, 
and quiet or in repentance and rest is your salvation and quietness and trust is your strength, but you won't have any of it. Listen, I have a mission set for you. Get quiet get still, get strong in me. The eyes of the Lord range throughout the whole earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Listen, I'm looking for somebody to get in the fight. I'm looking for somebody to get their hands dirty in the muck and the mire. I'm looking for somebody who's willing to be mocked and scoffed and reviled and stoned and sawed in two. I'm looking for somebody who's weak so that I can fill them with strength that they might be mighty in battle. I am looking for somebody who is willing to go even though they do not know where, yet where they're going, but in faith and in obedience, they just start walking like Abraham did. I'm looking, you're not gonna miss it. So still and quiet yourself in me so I can make you strong. And if you truly are fully committed to me, and if the sincerity of your heart is thus that when you say, Lord, do with me whatever you will, I bring the whole tithe of my life into your storehouse. He says, watch that I won't break open the storehouses and pour out on so much blessing on you that you won't have room enough to store it. And he will tell you where to step out in faith. But I'm telling you what, it will be unbelievably uncomfortable and it will be high, high, high cost, but it will be even higher reward. Light and momentary troubles, achieving in you an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So you fix your eyes not on what is seen, but it was unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal, right? The glory that's going to be revealed is not even worth being compared to all these things that you may have to endure. And he's like, because listen, they saw me in full and rejected me. Can you imagine what I have in store for you who know me in part and you stand firm in the faith? You are alert, you stand firm in the faith, you act like men, you are strong, as it says in 1 Corinthians 13, right? Oh, Mike, question, anything? <laughs> well, Jamie, as always, it was a winner, winner biblical dinner right there, man. Let me tell you. I mean, uh, and, and, and you know, the thing is, people think you and I aren't real, right? Like we're, we're just like on the internet and things like that. I assure you, people, we are real. And, and uh, you can come out and touch us if you want to. We won't, we won't uh, as long as you touch the right places, we, we won't shun you away. I mean, but the thing is, when we all get out there, Jamie, and life's going, life's going smooth, right? I mean, you know, there's, there's no speed bumps. It's just, you know, you're, you're on route 66, taking a slow cruise across the country. And then all of a sudden the Lord says, Hey, Jamie, you make, you need to make a left turn. And you're like, I don't want to make a left turn. And he's like, no, you need to make a left turn. How do you deal with that? In reality, for everybody listening on this call tonight, when the Lord comes to you, like he did recently, and said, you need to go to Colorado, you need to go to Missouri, you need to look at this, you need to upset your, the possibility of upsetting the status quo you have there is frightening. How do you deal with it? I fear the Lord. I mean, that's it. It's like, I fear the Lord. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. And, and uh, you know, to those who fear the Lord, he'll reveal the mysteries of this covenant. That's the depth of the gospel. And to those who fear the Lord, his children will be mighty in the land. And, and to those who fear the Lord, he will give them confidence. So it's like, and, and, and if the Lord delights in a man's way, he'll make his steps firm and, and on and on. So like, so when the Lord does that, it's like, my, my heart is filled to overflowing with his word. And so then it just comes rushing in like, like son, do this thing. Like, listen, it, I mean, there's a reason why God had to tell Joshua so many times, be strong and courageous. Everybody get that? Because he wasn't. They're like, oh, Joshua and Caleb. Oh, Joshua and Caleb. Yeah. Like, okay, pay attention to how many times the Lord has to tell him to be strong and courageous because he wasn't. And the Lord is good and he's tender and he's loving. And it is his faithfulness to us that is our shield and rampart. We have to stop willing and striving ourselves to try to be faithful to him and come underneath the one who is faithful. That's how. So it's like, listen, you know, I look at Mary's prayer when, when, when the angel Lord is, is like, hey, uh, yeah, you're going to bear the savior of all the world 
And here's what you're supposed to call. And she's like, I, I mean, what do I say to that? I don't have any skin in the game. May everything be done according to what you've said. Like li- literally that's like the reduction of my reality is like, what in the world am I, you said, write a book, Lord. I don't even read books, Lord. Who in the world would read it? Any, who, like, what are you talking about? Write a book. And he's like, but it's like, I, I don't know, God, may everything be done according to what you said, you know? And like, and on to the next one, on to the next one. And, and, and just a quick, quick uh, side note, you know, you mentioned about the, you know, most people, they have very little speed bumps in their life, but I, I'm under the, the understanding that it's actually the opposite. Most people have a pretty hot mess reality, but in that hot mess reality, they still manage and maintain it by the strength of the flesh, which means that they're actually under a curse, right? Jeremiah 17, they, they, they have hot mess relationships. They have hot mess realities. They have lukewarm, you know, maybe interactions with the Lord. They can't seem to find that place of communion. They go from thing to thing, distraction, to distraction, busyness to busyness. And actually they are not on easy street. They're on a pothole street, like from the Midwest, right after a hard winter. And, and, uh, and yet it's in that reality where the faith walk becomes that much more important. Lord, this may cost me everything. But I am going to tell my warring adult children who are rebels against you the truth of who you are once and for all time with nothing held back. You see how this you see how this is faith in action? Lord, I have a hot mess reality, and my wife's working like crazy, and I'm working like crazy. By faith, you would say, so what if we live in a mobile home, if we have peace in our marriage? I'm going to be the high priest of my household by faith. I'm going to tell my wife, stop your job. We're putting the house on the market. We're getting rid of all this debt burden and we're going to reduce our whole reality by faith, believing that the Lord will show up and he will provide what we need and he will reconcile us to one another so that our ministry and our testimony will stop being marred with the crappy busyness of this world. You see, this is, this is faith in action, right? It doesn't look like what you think it looks like. It looks like confessing your sins one by faith, even though I look, I feel like a fool and I want to protect myself, which actually means that I have selfish ambition, which actually means that wherever there's selfish ambition, there you'll find disorder in every evil practice, James 3, 3. Because I'm so concerned about self, that means my strength is in the flesh and my confidence is in myself. So I'm actually under a curse. So by faith, I'm going to die to self and I'm going to confess. I'm going to put to death the religious spirit in me. And I'm going to confess to my brothers and sisters that I'm a hot mess and I'm desperate for a move of the Lord in my life because I have X, Y, Z sin issues in my reality by faith. And without faith, it's impossible to please me and my righteous ones will live by faith. See, see, this is, this is what people aren't connecting the dot. What a faith walk looks like. It looks unrestrained it looks scandalous it looks unbridled it is because you are putting the reins in the hand of the true and better warrior king jesus on the horse and that is the testimony of meekness the meek shall inherit the earth who what's it mean to be meek it means a war horse bridled you and your spirit are warring, 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 but you throw the bridle and the bit of the gospel of Jesus Christ in your mouth and you trust the reins to the one who is faithful, to the one who is strong, to the one who is righteous, to the one who has peace, to the one who is comfort, right? And you put the reins in his hands and you say, by faith, Lord, Make me a righteous man or woman, because listen, we are the only thing in the land of the living that can testify to who you are. If I blow it, Lord, I blow it big time. If I blow it, I blow it under the souls of men from everlasting to everlasting. If I blow it, Lord, because of my love of self and because of my flesh and because of my fears and because of my anxieties or because of my greed or because of my my complacency and comfortableness, if I blow it, if you blow it, ladies and gents, you blow it big time. That's why the fear of the Lord must be at the root of why you walk by faith. And that's why walking by faith is so powerful because it shuts the mouth of all unrighteousness. It shuts the mouth of religious spirited. It shuts the mouth of the pagan unbelieving world. It shuts the mouth of the powers of darkness because by faith I say he is who he said he was. 
I'll prove it to you. Watch this. I'll, I'll be unrestrained and I'll entrust everything to the one who judges justly. Mock me, revile me, scoff me, whatever, re reduce who I, whatever it is, I'm good to go because my identity is in Christ alone. And that is why it is such an affront to the powers of darkness that we walk by faith. That is why it's so, it's how it's, there's three things that faith accomplishes, right? It is your, te it testifies to the completed work of Christ or not, or you take from it, or you say it's insufficient, right? So your, your faith is either saying it is sufficient or by your deeds, you're saying it's insufficient. I don't believe you, God. I don't trust you, God. Christ wasn't enough. He wasn't whatever. It, and, and we even do that in our own religious, do, you know, our re religiosity, Faith is an open rebuke against the powers of darkness who saw them fall and knew them fall. And faith is a big deal because it's temporary. You only have one shot to walk by faith. You go all in, you know, and, and I know for me personally, everybody's different. I, I would never, I would, I definitely would never challenge somebody to try and, and be like me, but I, I've actually prayed like, Lord, what, what does it look like to be like Paul who like ha, who is so secure in his testimony and like so confident in his walk with you that he says, follow me as I follow Christ. Have you ever thought about that? Do you realize how secure you have to be in your righteous life and in your righteous living that you would boldly, and it was, and it was true. He wasn't doing it in arrogance or haughtiness, but that you would say, listen, keep your eyes on me because I've kept my eyes on Christ. Watch what I do and do what I do. If anybody comes preaching anything different than me, let them be a curse. I'm so confident in my walk with the Lord. I'm so undone by this gospel. I so walk in the spirit that literally I'm confident enough to say, watch my life. I wouldn't say that right now as a 39 year old guy. I would never, I would never say, watch me closely because I might grieve my testimony. I might, I might mar the testimony if you look too closely. I know I do right? I'm a carnal flawed man. But uh, anyways, I don't know where I was going to all that. Once again, as usual, I, I get on a tangent and then I lose my brain, get scrambled. But um, let faith be your testimony. And there may be areas right now where the Lord's testing you. I don't care who you are. And I don't, I really don't care what your woundings in life have been. I mean, I do, right? I'm tender towards you. I, I hate sin. I hate the sin of, I hate the sin of people that have been imposed on you. I, I hate the sin of lawless rebels. I hate the sin of my own flesh, right? So I'm tender towards you in that regard. But like, I, I don't really care about your, your woundings. And I don't care about your lack of resources or your lack of whatever, whatever excuses we can come up with. It doesn't matter. It is the fact that you know and understand your God. You are weak. He's not. You are infirm. He heals. You are not equipped for battle. He gives you strength for battle. You can't resurrect. He is the resurrection, right? You're not wise. Maybe you're unlearned and uneducated. Well, the world around you better be astonished and take note that you've been spending time with Jesus. He is wisdom, right? Like, like listen, in him is everything. So if you put to death the, the excuses... And the complacency, which by the way, scripture says, woe to the complacent, the waywardness of the simple destroys them and the complacency of fools is their ruin. Woe to the complacent, right? You say, Lord, forgive me for what I've been complacent. He goes, oh yeah, you're forgiven. That's what me and my son do. Okay, stand up. We're going that way. You, know, you don't look back. Okay, you've been complacent. It's done and over with. Let's go this way. You say, Lord, forgive me where I've been complacent. Forgive me where I've been fearful and timorous because you haven't given me a spirit of fear. God, sorry, my I marred, my faith was weak and I marred your testimony and I didn't believe in the sufficiency. When you said you haven't given me a spirit of fear, but a power, love and a soundness of mind, I've never believed you in that, God. And I walk around in fear about everything from failed relationships to money, to health, to validation, to esteem, to whatever. God, forgive me, I've been fearful. God, forgive me, I've been complacent. Lord, I know that you say that you're looking, your eyes are ranging, scouring the whole face of the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to you. Okay, Lord, today I am fully committed to you, Lord. 
So now I know by faith that you will give me the strength for whatever you, you require of me next, because you said it. And by faith, I believe you that you will give me what I need to accomplish whatever you would have me do next. So Lord, what would you have me do? And then you're quiet. And then you listen for the Lord, right? So this is what a faith walk looks like. And I, I will tell you this. I would say it never gets easier. Never. You know what? You know what the first faith test for me was, Mike and Jeannie, you guys know this. It was going to, to the Whitestone Remnant Conference in Montana. I had, there was no way, I'll, you guys know I was a firefighter paramedic. So that means we work 24 hours a time. So you don't just get to take off work, right? Or like, if you do, you owe a guy and then you owe three guys and then you're working like three, four days, you know, 48, 72 hours straight and you're up for that long. And I was like, I can't get time off of work. We don't have a penny. We had three kids under the age of three. I don't know how that works. My wife's hot. I couldn't handle myself. I don't, I don't know what to tell you. We had three kids under three, right? And and, uh, and I'm like, there's no way. And I just felt the Lord say, if you show up, I'll show up. And it's like, okay, Lord, I don't know. By faith, I'm going to go out there by myself. I don't even really know these guys. I mean, I heard of Steve, but I, it's quail, but I hadn't really, and I was like, okay. I go. And from that meeting, every single step thus far in my walk was born out from that. And it's taken a decade for that faith to be made manifest and to, you know, even what you guys are seeing in here and right now, but it was just that simple. It was just that simple. Mike. Well, and that's the thing, Jamie. I mean, and, and that's the thing I want everybody on this call to understand. It takes that single step. I mean, it really does. You know, uh, Jamie, he's got these three kids under three, which, yeah, I don't get how that worked with your wife either, but God bless her. And, <laughs> and, you know, I mean, no money, no time, but he went to Bozeman, Montana and the Lord showed up. So you guys have to leave your house. You have to leave your comfort zone. That's the thing. It's really comfortable where I live. Like, I don't have to deal with the insanity of the world here. But I have to leave here to be where it is that the Lord wants me to be. I have to do it. It's not a, you know, maybe I can, maybe, maybe I can't. It's like, you have to do it. Uh, Paula Carter has a very good question for you. And, and she thinks that you, as I bleed here, um, she, she thinks you answered it, but Paula, if you're there, go ahead and ask Jamie. So we're, we're completely clear that your answer got, uh, given. Hi, Jamie. Thank you, Mike. Um, hey. I really enjoyed this tonight. It's been very encouraging and I totally feel you with the response of, but I hate your sheep. <laughs> and I'm wondering how did you get past that mindset um i have experienced a, a couple of episodes of severe betrayal in the last couple of years and um i have really pulled back just out of fear and you said he has not given us a spirit of fear but i'm just wondering um how you got past that idea of i hate your sheep and not really wanting to go out even though you knew you were called yeah no good question um it really was was realizing that the reason why I had such a disdain for the claimants of Christianity was because it was all about me. That's the bottom line is, is wherever there's selfish ambition or envy, though you'll find disorder in every evil practice, right? And the fruit of righteousness and peace and the effect of righteousness is quietness forevermore. And I had no quietness and I had no peace and I had disorder in my spirit. So then I go, okay, there's disorder and I'm filled with, so there's must be some kind of selfish ambition or envy some, cause that's what you said, Lord. Like that's what you're, so, so again, by faith, I'm going to take your word by faith. So Lord, help me expose this. And you say that when you're, when my confidence is in the flesh or my, my strength is in men that I'm a curse. So, so why, why am I so offended by these people? And I was like, Oh, because I, my confidence is actually in them to validate me instead of you. 
Oh, oh, because I want them to approve of me and validate me instead of you. I am selfish. I want my ambition says I want you to validate my walk with the Lord and my and the things that I have to say and the things I have to do. And you're not validating me. So now I have disorder and every evil practice in my spirit. So it wasn't until the Lord did business with me that I realized that that the and I still, I still, you know, it's not like I have a fullness of, of healing from it. You know, I have that lean towards that, my, my vomit returning to my vomit, but it's that, um, I began the Lord through the Holy spirit and working in me and rebuking me began to magnify the power of the gospel. I was magnifying me. I was magnifying the people around me. I was not magnifying the Lord and whatever you magnify becomes exponentially bigger. Hence magnification, right? Like it becomes exponentially bigger. So when you magnify the world, you magnify the emotion, you magnify the people, you magnify the offense. Well, that's going to become exponentially bigger. When you magnify the Lord, then that becomes exponentially bigger. And it's like, here's the bottom line is I don't care if you accept me or reject me. The Lord accepts me and rejects me. My con but See, I, I never finished the verse about Jeremiah 17, because guess what the very next section says? It says, but blessed is the one whose confidence is in the Lord, whose strength is in him. He will be like a tree planted beside a stream whose roots grow down deep. <coughs> <coughs> And to the waters and in the year of drought, his leaves are always green and he never fails to produce fruit. And I, and I realized like, well, I want to be blessed. Like I literally have chosen to be an accursed man because I'm looking at people around me all the time. I'm looking at circumstances around me all the time. I'm looking for validation. Lord, I want to be a blessed man. I'm going to look, I'm going to put my confidence and hope in, in, in you. And so here's the deal is like, I, like you literally, you see how Christ walked and how Paul walked out their ministry. They, they did not care who was behind them. Everybody ever pick up on that throughout the epistles and the gospels? They didn't care. They said, I'm going to glorify my father in heaven. Get in or get off. I don't care. I'm going that way. Paul's like, hey, listen, I'm going that way. Hey, listen, if anybody preaches another gospel, let him be a curse. Hey, if anybody among you claims to be a brother, sexually more impure, greedy, such a man as an adulterer, don't even eat with him. Hey, man, I'm going that way. Jesus is like, hey, you want to follow me? You better drink my flesh, eat my blood. Well, that's a hard teaching. Who can accept it? And many of his disciples departed from him that day. He didn't pursue them. He goes, I knew you weren't in it for the right reasons. So listen, I'm going that way. I'm all about my father's business. V zeal for my father's house consumes me. I'm not going to reduce the glories of the kingdom and reduce the glories of heaven and reduce Hi, the I have a salvation of souls. Like, um, I'm not so this is a loaner vehicle. My car's in the shop. Uh -huh. Is it? Hang on, hang on, the guys. monthly $45? Right, we'll have this one. I got a phone. Um, for another week. For another week. Hold on. Uh, what do you want to do? Can I can I use one of my free um yeah, detail yeah, yeah. You, or Jeanette, girl, well, you gotta detail. you gotta meet that uh, phone. <laughs> you <have a> <laughs> yeah, forty four ninety eight. Yes. Guys, I can't yeah, you find can use it in any car that you may have. Oh, okay. And then I'll wash it. You haven't Let's used it. See if I can, can figure it out. Yeah, this I can, okay, so I don't have this. Jeanette, you need to mute your mic and yeah, hear your conversation. Okay, Thank so you. Jamie, Jamie for this I'm going to ask you to rejoin. Oh, the loaner from the dealership. Okay. Okay. I'm going to mute everyone. And Jamie, you're going to have to join. Can okay, I do vacuum or no? no? Yeah, go ahead. In and out. Okay, and we're back. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Well, they, I mean, sometimes you just got to fight for your, your car, your car mechanic. What are you going to do? I think she was ordering a pizza with a coupon. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but I hope she gets the deal she was after. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. So, so uh, yeah. Um, I don't know what I was saying, but the bottom line is, is that um, I just realized that it, their, their offense isn't with me their their offense is with the lord and their offense and and they haven't grieved me they've grieved the lord and they haven't wounded me they've wounded the lord they're not rejecting me they're rejecting the spirit of the lord in me so it's like so it, it doesn't it doesn't mean that it doesn't suck right like you can we can acknowledge the woundings like nobody likes to feel betrayed or or uh scoffed or mocked or reviled i mean I've, I've experienced it my whole life from 
my family members that are all professing Christians. They look at my walk with the Lord with total distrust. <laughs> Everything I do, they do it with distrust because faith freaks people out. Does everybody understand that? Like legit walking by faith, it, it freaks people out. Why? Because it stirs up fears and insecurities in them. It makes them feel very insecure and it makes them feel very fearful. So rather than undergirding you and going, wow, that's cool. Praise the Lord. I would like iron to sharpen iron. Usually what they want to do is shut you down or, or like, a, what is it? Tobio and Sambalot, the guys around Nehemiah, they, they want to completely try to undermine what you're doing, even with a little jab or a little nip or a little nip or a little whatever, you know, sometimes it's not always like overt, but they let you know that they disapprove of what you're doing. And at the end of the day, go, it's not about me and you, it's about me and the Lord. And I want to be blessed by the Lord. And I want to be a righteous man. So I am going to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And then all these other things, even, even if it's validation or companionship or accepted, like he said, he's promised he'll add those to me. So by faith, by faith in action, I'm just going to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And I'm going to take all these thoughts captive and all this stuff and i'm going to make them subordinate to christ and i'm going that way and if you if you come in next to me or if you come in behind me praise be the lord if not praise be the lord right either way it's awesome yeah you know and, and guys you you know you have to understand jamie and i we are we have fears you know we we want things, right? Like Jamie wants a new truck. I want a new truck. We want a nice house. We want to be comfortable. But the thing is, if you have faith, none of that matters because your comfort comes through Jesus. It comes through the love. And But you have to work at it. It takes action. We all have, I had kids that wouldn't talk to me for years because I screwed up. You know, we all have that. We all have some problem within our family. And Jamie's family thinks he's, you know, nuts. You know, I mean, it happens. But if you have faith, you keep walking. And that's the thing. You put one foot in front of the other and you keep going no matter what. And you will be taken care of. So, Jeannie, uh, my wife, <clears throat> do you have any questions for Jamie tonight? I love putting her on the spot. Yes, he does. <laughs> um, gosh, Jamie, no, this was so good and so timely uh, because I think a lot of us are, are getting, we're looking for fleshly solutions with all the, even the alternative news that's getting hit in our face every day. Even the rumble and the telegram and the, you know, and the bit shoot and the bridey on. And so what I'd like to know is like, for example, you were invited to go to um, Colorado with an, op with an opportunity. And yet, whether the opportunity is right for you or not, you were obedient to go and pursue it. And we don't know the outcome when we are obedient. So can you, can you kind of go, can you kind of share how sometimes God gives us surprises along the way, even if we don't get the outcome we want, because it's not about us and it never was. Yeah. I mean, it, it's like, how do you know, unless you show up, you know, I mean, most of you guys have heard the Iraq story. It's like, you show up in your limited understanding. And yet he says, I'll do a measure to be more than you could even ask or conceive of. And he always does. But guess what? You have to show up. You have to bring something. You know, James 2.14 talks about how you cannot be saved by faith alone. Again, this freaks people out because they go, oh, law, salvation, all, blah, blah, all these doctrinal things that have crept in. It's like, take all the doctrine off the table and just read the word. Just read James, right? It says it plainly like you're actions testify to your faith faith alone can't save faith going i'm saved in jesus christ and i'm going to sit the rest of my life on my couch and make sure that everything's padded with all these redundancies of safeties and comfort built in it, it, it's not it's not going to work you know what sometimes a faith walk is sometimes the faith walk is getting up again and going back to your dead-end job sometimes that's that's what faith looks like 
by faith, you're going to get up again and you're going to go into that place again, the same place you've been doing for 20 years and there's no thrills and there's no highlights reels and there's no perceivable major impact on the world around you. But by faith, you get up and say, Lord, what would you have me do today? And he says, nothing. I haven't required anything of you. Love your wife, go to work. See, and by faith, your reward is not in this life. You have no idea what that's doing. You have no idea what the outcome is. You have no idea the glory and the honor and the praise that the Lord is going to pour out on you because that took faith. <clears throat> Some people, it takes faith, like in my reality, it takes faith to be restrained. The Lord says, sit, be quiet, do nothing. That, believe me, that takes crazy faith for a guy like me. But for other people, there, it takes faith when the Lord says, get up and go out and it's going to cost you everything. And you don't get to know why you do not get to know the outcome. You don't get to see the fruit. You don't get any of that. You just do it because that's what I've required of you. And you do it by faith. And that will be accredited to you as righteousness. I mean, you think of Noah, right? How successful was Noah's ministry? Anybody? I mean, come on, 120 years of preaching righteousness. It says that Noah was a preacher of righteousness, 120 years and not one, not one single person responded to his message to turn towards God. Not one. I doubt if his, I mean, given all the extra biblical texts of, in all the lineage of the sons, I, it doesn't even seem like his sons did. They were just benefactors of his faith, right? Like, like, I mean, it's, it's crazy when you think about it. So yeah, if, if we don't hold out fish and loaves, there's nothing for the Lord to supernaturally multiply, right? If we, don't, if we don't show up and put the hands on somebody, there's no way of knowing if they would be healed. If we don't step out and die to ourselves and have a very hard conversation with our adult children or whatever, our neighbors, our unbelieving spouse about their eternal placement, you have no idea. You did not create any opportunity for the Lord and for the spirit to work because you had no faith, right? So that's why it's so critical to walk by faith and not by sight. And remember this, what it says in Hebrews 11, it says, none of them, the heroes of the faith, none of them received what they were promised in this life. None of them. It was for the joy set before them that they endured it all. Just like it was the joy set before Christ that he endured the cross. That's why you walk by faith, not by sight. You walk by faith and you walk in hope and you hold out love because you know that faith and hope are temporary. They're going to pass away. And I'm telling you, the glory far outweighs any cost that we can endure in this life. So, yeah, I mean, that's always, I've had people ask me before, which believe me, I don't say this with any vain glory, but like how, Oh, Jamie, how have you done so much in your life? You're so young and you've done so much. I'm like, I don't know. I just show up and the Lord shows up. So like he, like I live intentionally. I only get one shot to glorify the Lord. One shot. I get one. I, I don't, I'm not promised another. I mean, I have a huge rainstorm going on. I'm surprised that the, the power hasn't gone out. I'm not guaranteed that I'm not going to be zapped by lightning right now. And praise God, wouldn't that be awesome? I get to go home. Right. But like, it testifies that I know that I'm a foreigner here. I don't belong here. I'm an elect exile of the dispersion. I'm trying to get home. I'm like Ulysses in the Odyssey, like strike me to the mass of the ship, point me to where I'm supposed to go because the ship's going to be dashed in the rocks. The sirens are calling out my name. The Cyclops is trying to deceive me. There's a great whirlpool over there. Like tie me to the mass of the ship. I'm just trying to get home to my king. And it's like, whatever it takes to get home, I'm going to do it. Lord, what would you have me do? Lord, what would you have me do? I get one shot. And so people ask me, how have you done so much? I say, I just live very intentionally. I live very intentionally because I know there's no do-overs. I don't get to do over one second. Not one of you gets one second back. So when you blow it with your wife in that evening, boy, you better reconcile quick because you're not getting one of those seconds. What in the world is the point of staying angry and frustrated? You don't get one of those seconds back. When you're living in insecurity, about your body or your life or your lot or how God created you, all that time is being squandered, squandered. All those thoughts, all those vain thoughts that are all about self and it's all about you and it's all about you and it looks like in your, you feign the victim. You don't get one of those seconds back. 
Put to death the deeds of the flesh. Live as a slave to righteousness for Christ Jesus. Live intentionally. You do not get one of those seconds back that you lived in self-deprecating negative self-speak. Like, like you live intentionally, right? And it's like all this living for a retirement, what a joke. Please show me retirement in the scriptures. Please. And please show me health care in the scriptures because with retirement comes reduce, reduce health care. Please show me social security. All of this American Babylonian muddy magic system has been strategically introduced to keep the people of God from living and being the people of God. We are lovers of money and we can't serve two masters. Even though it looks like good stewardship, it's feigned and masked as good stewardship by the pulpiteers, by the puppeteers in the pulpits. It's actually an anathema to the way God has called you to live because none of it requires faith. Or I can't say none, but very little, right? You get the context with which I'm saying these things dogmatically. So, and, and I know even me just saying that last little diatribe, that I, in, including my own family members, they get very, very frustrated that I speak dogmatically about that kind of stuff. They're, and they're awesome. They love the Lord. They live their whole lives for the Lord. But there's that one area, that one area that they just can't relinquish because of fear, because of fear. And because, because it's, it's masked with good stewardship, but actually it's fear, right? So... Any other questions? Amen. I have a question. It's it's really uh, just a scripture. I'm just going to read it, uh, Jamie, and so appreciate you sharing your heart. Um, it's from the book of Habakkuk. I want just a few verses here. The oracle of the burden of which Habakkuk saw. How long, O Lord, will I call for help, and thou will not hear? I cry out to thee violence that was going on in his culture, yet thou dost not save. Why dost thou make me see iniquity and cause me to look on wickedness? Yes, destruction and violence are before me. Strife exists and contention arises. I think about so much that's going on in our country. Therefore, the law is ignored. It's ineffective. And justice is never upheld. The wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, justice comes out perverted. God's response, look among the nations. Observe. Be shocked, astonished, wonder, because I'm doing something in your days. You would not believe if you were told. For behold, I'm raising up the Chinese communists, excuse me, the Chaldeans, that fierce and impetuous people who march through the earth and seize dwelling places which are not theirs. Now, he, of course, he gives the whole profile on Babylon. And then in chapter three, he says, he says this way, Lord, I have heard the report about, about thee, and I fear. Lord, revive your work in the midst of, of the years in the midst of the years, make it known in wrath, remember mercy. In verse 16, I heard in my heart, my inward parts trembled at the sound, my lips quivered, uh, decay enters my bones, and in my place I tremble because I must wait quietly for the day of distress for the people to arise who will invade us. So I think we're living in a time, and I know you know what's going on between now and let's say the end of this year, there's lots going on that could be very, uh, the way I see it, is going to be unprecedented challenges for the church and the body of Christ in these, these days to really rise up in authentic faith that you've been talking about, Jamie. Absolutely. And let me, Habakkuk is actually probably my favorite book in the Bible. And it's funny because you talk, most believers are like, Habakkuk, what's in Habakkuk? I'm like, oh, I love Habakkuk. I read it all the time. Actually, uh, Habakkuk 3, 1 and, 1 and 2 is what I quote almost every time I speak somewhere. But here's, here's what um, Doug was reading. He, here's how it finishes up in verse 17, Habakkuk 3, 17. Right after it talks about, I'll wait patiently for the calamity to come on the nation invading us. So here's the testimony to faith. It is perfect summation, Doug. Thank you for, for what we've been talking about. It says, yet, though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vine, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful and God, my savior. That's what it looks like to walk by faith. That's what it looks like to walk by faith. 
It's yet, it's the yet, and it's the but, and it's the therefore, and it's the so then, and it's the now then, and it's the, it's all these wonderful trans transition words about therefore I do not, yet I do not lose heart, right? The Lord's mercies are new evermore. Like, listen, they're putting teeth, gravel in my mouth and breaking my teeth out. I mean, read Lamentations 2, <clears throat> 2 and 3. I mean, read what Jeremiah is going through and he's like, yet I call this to mind and therefore I have hope. You know, I won't be cast off for the Lord forever. Like I'll wait patiently on the Lord. You know, he, he may give me the bread of adversity and the drink of affliction, but, but he's not going to be hidden from me forever. Right. I'm going to hear his voice behind me saying, this is the way walk in it. Whether I turn to the left or to the right, like this is what a faith, like faith walk looks like. And listen, church, you have to train now for the fight. You're not yet in. So you, you can't just all of a sudden when the Chinese are par, parachuting in and, and coming up the Columbia River board, Gorge and coming across the, the Arizona and Texas border, you can't go, now I'm going to have super duper faith in the Lord. It doesn't work that way. I can't choose tomorrow to go run a marathon. I, I used to, but now I got bad knees because I did that, right? It's like, I can't go from the couch to a marathon. I can't go from the couch to, to a top tier you know, operator in the special forces. It takes testing and endurance and perseverance. And guess what? It says, add to your faith, perseverance and let, per add to your faith, perseverance and let perseverance finish its work. Why? So that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. It has to do something in you. So you train for the fight you're not yet in so today tonight the lord has required something of you that's of faith you may seem it may seem small to you nope you're training for the fight you're not yet in you're dying to self you're dying to the things of the world because i'm telling you what's coming on this nation because we're owed it by the way i don't buy into any fleeting notions of q anon trust the plan faulty revival uh uh emotionally predatory stuff listen we're owed we're owed what's coming to this nation. The Lord decrees it, right? Let can calamity come upon a nation unless the Lord has decreed it? Absolutely not, right? You're like, like, and that that's fine because the Lord has a way of of providing and persevering and covering over and and a hiding us and giving us a place to dwell and abide and to commune with Him in the midst thereof, right? So we have to train for the fight we're not yet in with faith because. When we look at Daniel 11 and we look at Daniel 12 and we look at the book of Revelation is, you know, this calls for patient endurance on behalf of the saints. I, we won't get in all the different rapture, you know, doctrines and stuff like that. Listen, no matter what your day to day, I, I know because I get your emails and your phone calls is requiring patient endurance endurance on behalf of the saints. I know that the powers of darkness today currently already are wearing out the saints. They're grinding you to the bone. It takes faith now, faith now willingly, rather than later on desperately to begin preparing ourselves to trust and have our identity in Christ alone, period. Not in our bank accounts, not in our homes, not in our, what we think are our church bodies, not in our family or family members, not in our children, not in our marriages, definitely not in our governments, right? Our institutions around us in Christ alone, in Christ alone. That's why I try to sing that hymn constantly in Christ alone, right? From life's first cry to final breath, Christ, uh, uh, Christ, Christ uh, prepares my destiny, right? Like no power and how, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. Nothing else matters except for Christ alone. And that's what it's all centered on. And so as we continue to exercise our faith muscles, right? Don't let them atrophy. You have to work a muscle. You have to work it and work it and work it to make it have strength, to make it grow, to give it the endurance that it needs. As we exercise our faith muscles, then it says the Lord, if you're fully committed to him, he will strengthen you for the mission set he's foreknown you for. And it's going to be nothing but by faith in God that we endure what's coming. Nothing. Not my preps, not my skill set, not my understanding of eschatology, not the latest, greatest intel, you know, all the stuff that's going on all the time, you know, scrolling my phone for the dopamine drip about what's going on in my world around me. None of that is going to matter. It will be by faith in God alone. Lord, do I stay? Do I go? Do I cross the street now? Do I not? 
Lord, make water come out of the rock or dine of thirst. Lord, make food come down from heaven. Lord, you are in so command over even creation itself that you inverse the roles and you make water come from the ground and you make the bread come from the heaven where the water should come from the heaven and the bread should come up out of the ground. You get what I'm saying? Like by faith alone, we go, God, I know that you have said that no king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all of its strength, it cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him and whose hope is in his unfailing love to deliver them from death and to keep them alive in famine. By faith, Lord, I'm going to believe in that and I'm going to walk out in faith in that promise. Well, thank you, Jamie. Now, guys, we're going we're gonna to have to wrap up tonight. I'm going to... Mark has a, a comment. I'm going to get to him. But listen, I mean, Jamie's going to be at, at his summit in August. I'm going to be at Jamie's summit in August. I'm going to be in San Diego. Jamie's going to be in San Diego. And do you think we really want to be there? We want to go and serve Jesus. Now, what's your excuse? Are you going to get out there and do it? You know, I mean, Vic's going to be there. Uh, you know, get out there and do it. Just, just be a part. Get, you know, stop. I mean, I hear, like Jamie said, I get these emails from everybody. I want to, I want to ask you a question before I give it to Mark, and I want you to think and pray about this tonight. Everything you've been through over the last fifteen months, all the research you've done, all the bitterness, all the arguments with people about COVID and the lockdown and all that stuff. Did you change anything? Nope, you didn't. And the reason you didn't <clears throat> is because God's in control. So have faith. Uh, let's go to Mark. Mark, you have something to share? Or we lost Mark. Well, okay, we're having a crazy storm up here, and I'm sure he's getting the same thing up there. Can you hear me? Yeah, are you there? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, you're, my, you're the last up here, Mark. You're it. Yeah, no, something's in my uh, electronics because they showed me I'm muted and it wasn't working. So, Jamie, I wanted to add to what you said about endurance, training, perseverance, what have you, and that is the key. We both know from our military experiences how we got and how we survived and how we helped others through that training and that perseverance and the character, et cetera. But we go to Romans 5, and this talks about your faith. Therefore, I'm going to read from the Amplified. Therefore, since we are justified, acquitted, declared righteous, and given a right standing with God through faith, let us grasp the fact that we have the peace of the reconciliation to the hold and to enjoy peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. Through him also, we have our access, entrance, introduction by faith into the grace state of God's favor in which we firmly and safely stand and let us rejoice and exult in our hope and experiencing and enjoying the glory of God. Now, here's the meat of it. Moreover, let us be full of joy now. Let us exalt and triumph in our troubles and rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that pressure and affliction and hardship produce patience, perseverance, and unwavering endurance. And endurance, fortitude, develops maturity of character, approved faith, and tried integrity. And character of this sort produces the habit of joyful and confident hope of eternal salvation. Such hope never disappoints or deludes or shames us for God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has given this to us. I think that's pivotal. And where Paul is talking about that in Romans was pivotal. We have to understand in James, James 1, it also says, count all joy for the trials and tribulations you, you suffer. It's in those places that God produces increased faith. Faith is also a gift of the Holy Spirit, something that something can be asked for, someone can ask for. That faith pro promotes us and sends us forth as it's building that character, as it's building that perseverance, as it's building everything. You go back to Matthew chapter 10 and read about the apostles, the first time he sent the 12 out and what they had to do and how they had to endure and how they had to see things and how they were going to be 
be persecuted and hated for him, etc. You don't do that on your own accord. You don't have it in you. But as you build your faith up in him and allow him to become through each day, picking up your cross, denying self, putting off self, putting on Christ, letting the armor of God completely be endued and not look back at those things and woe is me. My life, I could say, what a, what a horrible life. But you know, everything I came out of made me who I am today. 